Sometimes it seems like the Buddha had all the fun. In his meditation, he got to survey the world, the whole world. As for us, he tells us when we meditate, focus on your breath. We don't get to move around that much. We don't get to expand our horizons. We have to narrow our horizons. But those two facts are connected. Because when the Buddha surveyed the world, he surveyed it several times. In the first two times, the lesson kept coming back. Look into your present moment. Look into what the mind is doing right here, right now. Because that's going to solve the problem when you survey the world. The first time he surveyed it, he saw the world as being like a stream that was drying up. And there are fish in the stream fighting one another over the water. And they're all going to die anyhow. It all seemed pointless. And he looked around. He said, every place he could look for happiness, what somebody had already laid claim to. So if he was going to have to find his happiness outside, he'd have to fight somebody off, just like the fish. So he looked inside. He said that there was an arrow in the heart. And if you could pull that arrow out, then you'd be free from the suffering. So the problem is not with the world. The problem is in the heart. On the night of his awakening, when he surveyed the world again, he had already seen his previous births. The question was, was there a pattern? He saw that there was a pattern. All beings pass away and then are reborn in line with their karma. Their karma depends on their views, and their views depend on who they listen to. And he saw the way karma worked itself out. It wasn't the case if you did something in this lifetime, it would automatically lead to a certain type of rebirth. It was what you did was put into the karmic mix. And then at the moment of rebirth, there were some choices you were going to make, which could change your course. So the final upshot of that second survey of the world was look at the mind in the present moment, because that's where the important things are happening. After his awakening, he surveyed the world again. This time with the eye of an awakened one. He saw beings on fire with fires of greed, aversion, and delusion, but his fires were out. And so his relationship with the world was very different. At this point he was free from it. And that first time around there was a sense of terror, sanguega, because he was trapped in this world. But after his awakening he was freed totally free, to the point where if he had decided not to teach, he wouldn't be in debt to anybody. He didn't owe anybody anything. So if he had decided not to teach, nobody could do anything. Of course, we know that Sampati Brahma got upset. Here the Buddha had been spending all that time developing the perfections to be a Buddha, and now he's going to change his mind. So he came down and pleaded with the Buddha, please teach. There will be those who can understand. So the Buddha surveyed the world again, this time with an eye to see if there's anybody who would respond to his teaching. He saw that there was, which is why he decided to teach, even though it was going to involve a lot of difficulties. You read the story of his life, just this section in the Vinaya, all the problems that the monks and the nuns created for him. And those were the people who were supposedly his disciples. Then he had to deal with sectarians of other kinds. Here he was offering them a, a path to the end of suffering. They didn't like it. They would attack him. That's the way it is with the human world. There's a lot of ingratitude. But there are people who will benefit from the Dharma. So 
It's up to us to decide which category we're going to be in, and to take to heart the lessons that he learned. After surveying the world, his focus had to come back into the present moment every time. So ask yourself, do you have that arrow in your heart that the Buddha was talking about, the arrow that keeps you running after things that you're going to have to fight for? Now Kurt Vonnegut could imagine a world in which beings didn't have to feed off of one another, didn't have to compete with one another. But that's just in his imagination. The world we have is one where there's going to be competition. There's going to be struggle, because we all engage in a type of thinking that the Buddha called papancha. It's a hard word to translate, but basically it's the kind of thinking that starts with, I am the thinker. You've taken on an identity. And once you've taken on an identity as a being, you have to feed. And where are you going to feed? You're going to feed in the world. And guess what? There are other beings out there feeding in the same world. There's going to be conflict. So as you take on an identity in that way, you're putting yourself in a position where you have to get into conflict, all by the way you th because of the way you think. So the trick is to learn how to think in ways that don't involve an identity and don't involve a world. And we're going to do that again right here in the present moment. As you sit here meditating, you can look at things in terms of you as a meditator, successful or not successful. Or you can simply think, here are some events, events in the body in terms of the four, four properties, events in the mind in terms of the five aggregates. And what can be done with these things? Try to use the perceptions of the breath to give you an anchor. Then you apply your acts of attention and intention to stick here, to pay careful attention to what's going on. And you can create a state of concentration. If you can stay on this level, then when you see thoughts that would go out into the world again, as the Buddha says, you put them aside and try to stay just on this level of events happening right here, right now. And you're doing this to clear the decks, because eventually you want to see how those thoughts form the ones that pull you away, that want to go back to more babancha. And you can see what motivates them, that arrow that the Buddha talked about. So as you're here right now, any thoughts of who you are and what world you're in, just put them aside. You might think of a picture of the globe. And then one of those cancel the circle with the line through it. No worlds. Just events. That's how you learn how to take these things apart. Because once those worlds are formed, you either want to maintain them or you want to destroy them. In either case, you're going to have passion for the maintenance or passion for the destruction. And that's going to create more becoming and more becoming. Whereas if you just look at the events that would lead up to becoming, but don't let them get that far. Or if there's going to be a becoming, let it be the coming of concentration, where you're focused on your inner world, where it's not the conflict, aside from your own inner conflict. But at least you don't have to fight other people off. You don't get to see what's going on. So 
simply in terms of events. So learn how to survey this inner world on these terms. And the Buddha promises that you'll be able to get out of that sense of entrapment in the outer world. So someday you too can look at the world with a sense of being freed from it. And if you have something to offer to the world, fine. But even if you don't, you've still accomplished a great deal. <laughs>